Welcome back to another edition of the Net Report Podcast. I'm your co-host, Mike Broadbent. Joining me once again, my co-host, Richie Schneiderite. Richie, uh, it's been a bit since we podcasted. I've been in Florida, um, and we missed uh, we missed an instant reaction. Uh, the rare uh, the rare time we don't do it, but that's all right, because we'll cover that today. We got a commitment from a transfer wide receiver. Uh, believe it or not, we got a transfer <laughs> offensive player. I didn't think it would happen either, but it finally did. And we also got to talk the Rutgers-Iowa matchup from Sunday and preview some matchups going into the future. And we also have a lot of high school recruiting nuggets, which is going to drop at the end. So we got a ton. Uh, let's start off right away, though. We got a commitment from wide receiver Nassim Brantley, who is coming from Western Illinois. He previously spent time at Sacred Heart, so he was a teammate of J.D. Dorenzo. He mm -hmm. went to high school at Hal High School in Monmouth County. Uh, everything I've read about this kid sounds pretty good. Um, one thing off the top, though, it does sound like uh, he did break his leg late in the season, so I'm not sure of his availability moving forward in the spring, uh, but he did break his leg on November 12th against Indiana State. Um, <laughs> but he had a breakout season. So, Richie, what are you hearing about how this came together and what you, you're hearing about him as a player? So he entered the portal, and uh, that was pretty much it. Ruck Rutgers reached out right away. He's a South Jersey native. Uh, I'm seeing conflicting things. One says Farmingdale. Monmouth Jersey. County is not is not South Jersey. Come on. <sighs> Whatever, dude. I know Todrick got yelled at that for two that that for that on our boards too. And I'm like, I see ocean or like, and that's south to me. Like, I don't know. Um, whatever. You don't want to consider it South Jersey, but Farmingdale, New Jersey native. Um, I've also saw someone say he was a freehold native, so I don't really know which one it is. They're not too far apart, so it doesn't really matter. I guess at the end of the day. Yeah. Uh, plays high school ball at Howell, but uh, entered the portal, and that was that was kind of it. Rutgers reached out and just got him on a campus real quick. Uh, interestingly enough, he didn't really care for for the visit. Like, not, I'm not saying that in a bad way. He just didn't like. They asked him, like, "Hey, like, you want to do the whole like official visit? You want to go New York City? We'll go here. We'll do that." Uh, I think it's Top Golf is included at some point too. I'm sure they're going to get that new racetrack over there from the indoor go karts going too. So that would yeah, be cool. Yeah, definitely. But uh, he's like, no, I don't want to do any of that. I just want to check out the campus, see the facilities, talk with the staff, and just kind of see where you guys plan on using me. And that was pretty much it. And then uh, I think a week later, a week went by, and uh, he locked it in. He went home, discussed it with his family, and and that that was it. It's Jersey guy coming home again kind of leads towards uh, everything that's been happening with Rutgers in the portal with uh, – who else was it? Eric Rogers. Um, I feel like I'm missing some. Oh, uh, Charles Makwa. Uh, Isaiah only... Iden. Yeah, Isaiah Iden. Um, well, I Iden was not Jersey guy, right? Oh, no. So I thought you were just going over all No, the no, no. Guys. I'm saying, uh, yeah, Iden and Dixon were the only two. But uh, the two DBs and uh, now a wide receiver, all from Jersey, and just coming back home to play for uh, New Jersey's uh, State University. So it kind of transpired relatively quickly. Yeah, and this is a kid who uh, is – he had set his – he had the team high in receiving yards at Sacred Heart his final year there. Mm -hmm. He had 25 catches, 455 yards, and two touchdowns. He transfers to Western Illinois and then uh, has the best season of his career by far. He was named yeah. Conference Newcomer of the Year, first team all-conference. I think one uh, publication had him as second team All-American in 10 Phil games. Steel. He had 50 – Phil Steele. Yeah. He had 53 catches, 893 yards, and nine touchdowns. So this is a guy who who led that offense, and he didn't even play the whole season, and he just, you know, got all those accolades. Um, this is a guy who Rutgers really needed. Uh, they really needed an experienced wide receiver who can be like a, a you know, a number one or a number two at worst. Mm -hmm. He's 6'4", 200 pounds is what he's listed at, so he's a big body. I know there's been a lot of talk about how Kirk Soraka really prefers big-bodied receivers in his offense, mm -hmm. so that's probably – a uh, big reason why we went after him immediately. His PFF grades are okay. Or I, would sh I should say they're good. Um, but this past season, he had a grade of 71.8, which was 231st out of 1,047 qualifying wide receivers. And the year before that, he was he had a grade of 74.5. Uh, so a little bit better uh, in 2021 than 22. Uh, so this is a good get. Um, there were a few guys who I thought they should have went after earlier in the portal, but given that they didn't really have their offensive staff together, I get it why they didn't really go too hard in the offensive portal. Yeah. Um, but speaking of the offensive portal, do you think they're done in the portal before the next season? So put, put an over-under on how many more transfers you think we land before uh, the start of the 2023 probably, season. I'd probably say 
two, I'm going to say two and a half because I, I don't know if they'll get okay. to that three mark, but they're going to try to get to that three mark. Um, I think you definitely need another receiver. Like as as good as his numbers are for FCS level, it's not going to translate to 900 yards in the FBS level uh, no. with an offense that struggled mightily in the past three years, two years, five years, whatever it is. Um, yeah. So I, I mean, I think you at least need one more receiver. You could sell someone on being that number one. Now that you have him locked in, you could be like, all right, here's our number two. He's going to take some coverage away from you. Uh, he might take a couple snaps, but he's not going to take snaps away from you because you could be our number one, whoever that guy would be. So I think you try to sell someone on that. And then uh, there's like an open, there's openings all along the offense. Like tight end is their number one priority right now. Um, that's a major, major need. You lost tight end two slash two B, I guess, whatever you want to call a limo. Uh, Kanaka will be back. Johnny Langan's back, but neither of them really have done much since they've been on, on the bank. So you definitely need someone there that can come in and start right away. Uh, ideally, there's a Steve Stelianos just walking around on Lafayette's campus still, and you just grab one of them. But, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know who you get. It's going to be interesting. And then uh, I'm going to say a third just because this offense needs as much help as it can get. I think ideally Kirk and whoever the new O-line coach will be, uh, hopefully announced soon before spring practice, um, is going to look at this old line and they're going to say, shit, man, we need, we need somebody. We need someone along yep. this interior. Like we don't have JD Dorenzo anymore. We still have Willie Tyler at left tackle. Um, I can make Colin Pierce into a pretty good one. Iowan Brown's pretty solid. Um, who am I missing? There's another guard I'm missing. I don't uh, know. But Dunlap. Dunlap, um, who's worked with Kirk already, kind of understands, I guess, his offense. If healthy, could be decent. I think you got to at least get one more guard. At the very, very least, if not yeah. a tackle, if you could find a tackle, by all means, grab a tackle. But. Yeah, arguably our best offensive lineman last year, J.D. Dorenzo, was a one-year transfer guy. Yeah, who knows who's going to be ready from that big group of you know eleven freshman eligible guys from last year? None. None. I hate. You know. I hate to say it. It doesn't seem like. I know it sounds stupid to say because everyone's like, "Wow, he's four star, four star." They're still linemen. They have to develop. Like yeah. it takes time. Look around the Big Ten. How many redshirt freshman linemen do you see in the Big Ten starting? I mean, None. Yeah, maybe one if you're lucky. And that's probably because that kid was a top 20 kid. like, And he was massive before this. Yeah, and I think when you have, like, huge success stories like Pierce on our offensive line who goes from, like, I think he was at, like, 450 pounds coming mm -hmm. into Rutgers. And within yeah. one year, he just totally remade his body. I think he was, like, 330 the following year. Like, mm -hmm. that is the outlier. It's very hard to rebuild your body like that. And a lot of these yes. kids are coming in not overweight. They're coming in underweight. So if a kid is, yeah. you know, a hard worker in high school, you know, he's 250 pounds, and that's big for high school offensive linemen. Adding that last mm -hmm. 30 to 40 pounds is really hard for some kids. It's not something that's just, like, easy to do. And I know that they're recruiting a lot of big frame dudes, so you want to be able to, you know, project more more weight onto a frame. Sometimes it takes longer for certain kids than others. So. Yeah, I mean, one one example that I really like to use, and it's not a good example, or it's a good example, it's just not a good play. Um, Kobe mm -hmm. Asamoah is probably the most ready college guy out of that group, yep. and he got steamrolled and got 180'd a bunch of times when playing with Rutgers, uh, whether that be at the guard spot. Uh, I, I, I keep saying this, he's a center, he's a center, he's a center. He can't play anything else, he has to be center. So we'll see if maybe they bump Ireland Brown to guard and put Kobe at center, but still like he was the most ready probably of that entire group and still struggled mightily. So that just goes to yep. show you, these guys are not anywhere near ready. Like most of the time, like a Holland Pierce situation is not going to ever happen. And even if it does happen, most of the time, like most schools, Holland Pierce wasn't the starting right tackle in year two in, in most big 10 schools. So it's, it's hard to project these guys. They take a while. And uh, it's it's just going to take some time, and you just got to be patient with him. Like Dante Chin might be the second most college ready, and he's he's still not ready, in my opinion. So it's it's going to take time, but you need a transfer. So back to the original question that we shied away from. <laughs> uh, I think they get two and a half. I'd set it at two and a half. So receiver, tight end, and offensive line, and probably guard. Yes, I, I, ideally right. you don't need another defense person, but with this staff, they probably just want I mean, another DB for fun. If they're going to add a defensive player, I'll trust them. Uh, I've said this time and time again. It's you know, sounds like beating, beating a dead horse. You know, sounding the same drum. But if they want to add a defensive guy, Shiano is great with making scholarship numbers work, and he also knows what he's doing on on defense. So 
Um, if we add more defensive guys, it's unforeseen on our part, but I'll, you know, I'll take it because that means they're probably going to improve our defense. Yeah, that's true. Um, so we'll talk high school recruiting at the end. Let's talk basketball okay. though, because uh, Rutgers played Iowa on conference championship Sunday. Real, real quick. Shoot. Just because everyone's going to ask, where, where's this talk? Where's this talk? There's nothing new on the offensive line, coach. It's not ha nothing like happening. Yeah. We were told it was going to happen like last week. Now we're told it's still going to happen imminently. Not could be today, could be tomorrow, could be the next day. Uh, knowing with news dumps, maybe you just dump it on National Signing Day. And just, if you do, if it's a lower hire, if it's a higher hire, then you wait the next day, and it's like boom, wow, Rutgers just hired him. But anyway, yeah, uh, let's dive into that a little bit, not too deep. Um, <laughs> I think the one thing you'll we've we've talked about and noticed is how much experience has mattered in the hires he's made this offseason between Soraka, between Dave Brock. But another thing that I think is not being talked about as much is how much these guys are being paid. So Kirk Soraka obviously is getting one point four million, which is one of the highest salaries for any coordinator in the country. Dave Brock, sneakily though, also getting paid a ton of money. He's got Five hundred and fifty, I want to say, it's between five hundred and five fifty. You know, that's doubling five fifty or two. Yeah. Okay, that's like basically doubling his predecessor's salary in Demir Shaw. So, not only is he going for for experience, but he's got to pay these guys. So, what I think it could be happening is that there might be some sort of like prolonged negotiations with a guy or two that Shiano has targeted. I do think that list that we have you've created is going to be pretty bang on. I, I really, I think the philosophy of how we came to those names and the, the reason it's taking as long makes sense. Mm -hmm. If he's trying to get one of those guys and it's, you know, a, a long extended negotiation, but I just, I kind of wanted to throw that out there as well. Coaching yeah, stuff. I mean, um, we added a new name. I will say that we added Pat Fulherity, uh last week. I think it was, I don't remember what time it was or what day it was, but, uh, he's, he makes a lot of sense experience wise. He's got a ton of NFL experience, a ton of big 10 experience, uh, worked under Kirk Soraka and analyst role at Penn state in 2020. So they're relatively familiar with each other. And, um, I know I was talking to rich, uh, Siebert and I probably pronounced that wrong. The former giants offensive lineman, he's the head coach over at watch on Hills. Now I was just BS and going back and forth. We were talking recruiting. And then, uh, I was like, what do you think about Flaherty? He goes, honestly, Rutgers could not do any better than Flaherty. He is that good with offensive linemen. He's turned him. He's turned Sean O'Hara. He's turned Kareem McKenzie. And if you're a Giants fan, Kareem McKenzie fucking stunk. Yeah, he turned yeah. him into a good offensive lineman. So Giants fans, good thing you mentioned that because you should be familiar with him. He was your offensive uh, line coach for 12 years under uh, Tom Coughlin. He was the offensive line coach for both your Super Bowls in the mid two thousand yes. in the 2000s. So. He's got he's got a hell of a pedigree. I, I want to say he was a, an offensive line coach in the NFL for 20 years. Um, he spent 2021 as an analyst for the Giants, and he spent uh, 2019 and 2020 as an analyst for Penn State. He worked under Soraka, like you mentioned, at Penn State in 2020. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense. He's old. He's 66 though, so he would be a stopgap yeah. guy. Um, so and who he, knows if he's even if he even wants to coach at yeah this point. that's true i mean he's he's such a good coach apparently according to all these guys but not even he could help joe judge that team was shit <laughs> like that was it like that was done yeah or maybe he's the reason andrew thomas is good now who knows huh each own. <laughs> uh, i don't know to be determined but i i did want to touch on salary stuff and i let you mention the the new name that uh we've added to the offensive line hot board yes um, so let's talk basketball. So Rutgers fell for the second time this season to yeah. Iowa on Sunday, 93 to 82. Um, this Iowa team, man, they continue to give Rutgers problems. Um, I know how Rutgers fans like to talk about how we own the state of Indiana. I would say the state of Iowa owns Rutgers because um, I don't think we've ever beat them in basketball. They don't. They beat us in wrestling. They beat us – or sorry, yeah. we never beaten them in football. Uh, mm. In basketball, they – have beat us six of the last seven times. The only game we've won was that really weird game last year where we won 48 to 46. Um, this is a team that gives Rutgers problems, I think, because they're one of the only teams that can match up with Rutgers lengthwise. Like mm -hmm. they're a huge team. Uh, and they also can shoot the ball from deep really, really well. Um, Rutgers are really, our vaunted three point defense from early in the season seems to kind of be slipping a bit. Uh, so Rutgers has played Iowa in two of its last five games, and we've allowed 24 for 51 shooting in those two games combined. That's 47%. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, you know, the game against Michigan State, we allowed <clears throat> Michigan State to shoot 55%. We allowed Northwestern to shoot like 37% against us. We allowed Ohio State to shoot 38% against us. Uh, what did you see from this matchup? And do you think our three-point defense was maybe a little overrated? Yes. I know a lot of people yeah. are going to probably disagree with me on that, but um, maybe maybe not. Uh, as much as, like, even go back to the Penn State game, as, yeah, they went four of 26, but they had a lot of open looks. There was, like, two or three yeah. possessions yep. where they got multiple offensive boards and just wide open three, wide open three, wide open. They're just missing. It's that gypsy curse on the rims there. But, <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, uh, I think the three-point defense has to step it up. Well, anytime you got a team shoot 50% from three and they're attempting 20-plus threes, you're probably most likely going to lose. Um, yep. On top of that, going into this game, uh, or after this game, I should say, you just look at the foul numbers. Like it's it's yeah. brutal. Twenty five to fourteen. You can't tell me there's not a home home ref whistle. There absolutely is, and we've talked about that how many times on here. It's just the way the Big Ten is officiated. Yeah. Home teams get the whistle. Sometimes it's worse than others, but this was a particularly bad example of that on Sunday. Yeah. You can, there's touch fouls and almost every single play. You don't have to call every single touch foul either. They had double, more than double, the free throw attempts. They had 34 free throw attempts. Rutgers had 14. 29 yeah. of their 93 points came on fucking free throws. Yeah. Like, um, now, mind you, the offense played better in the second half. There's a reason they, they tied exactly, but the defense still kind of stunk because you can't give up 40 points, 40 plus in each half, 45 plus in each half. Jeez, I can't even, it's, it's that bad. Um, I if you told me before the game Rutgers is going to give up ninety points, I would have said you're an idiot, you're stupid. There's probably no shot in hell, and they gave up ninety three. So it just wasn't a wasn't a pretty game. Guys struggled. Um, well, at the same time, if we would have told you before the game that Rutgers was going to score eighty two, don't you I think you would have called probably you a liar. said, <laughs> "Well, don't you think you would have said, okay, then Rutgers won." Then yeah, like you yeah you don't expect Rutgers to allow ninety three points. Yeah, it's uh it just wasn't a great game. Um. Cam up and down again. Um, you can count on him one game, and then the next game he struggles. Now, hopefully, that doesn't leak into this next game against Minnesota. Um, Andre Hyatt, it's when he hits his threes, he's great. When he doesn't, it's like get off the floor. Um, yeah. So I, here's I an interesting stat for you: Rutgers is only allowed seventy plus points three times this season. Mm-hmm. Two of the three were to Iowa. The two highest scores of the season allowed by this Rutgers defense were to Iowa, 93 points and 76 points. The only other team to score 70 was Michigan State, who scored 70 exactly. So uh, we did not – we allowed them to go over the speed limit by a lot. Uh, if they were on any highway in the United States, they would have been 20 over, and they would have been probably facing some uh, some license suspensions. Uh, but <laughs> Rutgers just got totally shellacked. Well, now you're talking conference play. No, I'm talking about overall. Oh, yeah, so they did allow Temple, uh, Temple too. Sorry about yeah. that. Yeah, they allowed 72 to Temple. So four games with 70-plus. Mm-hmm. Um, the top two were still uh, to Iowa, though, with 76 and 93. Gotcha. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it is what it is. It's it's a loss. Iowa just plays good. They have they have length. They play defense. They shoot the shit out of the ball. I, I said it before the pod. I really think they're going to be a sneaky good NCAA tournament team. I know the Big yeah. Ten struggled in recent years, but – they're going to be one that I'm probably going to make to the second, maybe third round, depending on who the matchups are. So yeah. Chris Murray's great. They had just they have a really well built team. And Fran McCaffrey, who does end up choking in the tournament quite a bit, um, uh, has has a good team this year. Like there's not there's no knocks on them. Like I hate to say it, what the Big Ten is what it is, and that's why their schedule is uh what are they fourteen and six, fourteen seven, uh, something like that. Iowa or yeah, Rutgers. Yeah, Iowa, Iowa is, is like very similar. thirteen and eight. Thirteen. And Rutgers eight, is yeah. fourteen and seven. Actually, some they actually they some of their losses are just bad losses. Like, yeah, but they get good wins too. So it's like it's it's hit or miss with that team. That team I don't get, but I, I do think if they make the tournament, they're gonna be one to watch. Yeah, because I mean, what does it ultimately come down to in the tournament? It's it's shooting. Um, mm-hmm. They're one of the only teams in the Big Ten who can consistently shoot. Because uh, it's also about like, is it your night or is it not shooting wise and. If you yeah. shoot 25 threes and can hit about half of them, you're you're not going to lose many games, like you said. So yeah, um, I agree that they're a dangerous team. Um, probably second or third most dangerous team in the Big Ten outside of Purdue and maybe Michigan State at this point. But yeah, yeah, fair enough. Rutgers has uh. to kind of get back on its uh, horse here, though. Um, they're currently tied for third in the conference, behind only. 
Purdue and Northwestern, but they're in a three-way tie for third. Uh, mm-hmm. They get a good bounce-back opportunity tomorrow night against uh, the worst team in the Big Ten in Minnesota. Minnesota's 7-13 and on the season, 1-9 and in conference play. Uh, obviously, it's a must-win game because you lose to Minnesota. That's a quad four loss. You can't have those on your schedule, especially when we're trying to talk about getting, a, you know, I'd say we're firmly on the five-seed line right now, which also starts to get, like, preferential seeding. Mm-hmm. So uh, Rutgers really needs to win this one and win it in decided fashion uh, against Minnesota. I think Minnesota's missing its top scorer as well. Um, I believe you're right. I might be wrong now. Yeah, uh, Dawson Garcia hurt his knee about a week ago. He hasn't played since. He hurt his knee against Minnesota, Michigan. Um, but this is, a, yeah, we got to just go out and dominate this team. Get, you know, the good wheel back on our, our side. Get some kind of momentum going towards us because they have a uh, another makeup tilt against the team who beat them previously this year in Michigan State at the Garden on Saturday at noon. Uh, that's a game that Rutgers would really like to win. Um, make up for a loss. It sucks that this is a neutral site game. We'll kind of, you know, we could bitch and moan about that, but it, it is what it is. It's a game that we're not going to get, you know, at the rack, unfortunately. It's at MSG. Uh, but yeah. I, ideally, you win the next two games before you play a road game at number 21 ranked Indiana, who has uh, a, a bunch of momentum right now, and they're, they're tired of hearing that Rutgers owns them. So, yeah. So, I mean, hey, hear me out. It starts with Minnesota, right? Yep. Someone someone posted this on the board. Rutgers has been targeting Minnesota assistants for quite some time. So we're going to tie this in with football. And the Minnesota O-line coach is just going to get on the plane with the, football, the basketball team when they come to travel right, to Rutgers. To get and, out right now? I mean, uh, there you go. I forgot you still for it. <laughs> so when Minnesota travels to Rutgers today, tomorrow, uh-huh. whatever it is, the O-line coach, Brian or Bill Callahan, Brian Callahan? I Brian Callahan. Brian Callahan, because Bill Callahan's – Football coach Bill, too, right? I think. Yeah, Bill Callahan yeah. was Jeez. the former Ra- Raiders and Nebraska oh, head coach. Oh, yes, you're right. Yeah, yeah. So no, no, no. We're going. Brian Callahan is going to hop on the plane with the team, and they're going to be like, "What the fuck's football team doing here?" I had to use mm. it for recruiting or something. Recruiting some done. Fair money. I like it. Dead period. And then just hop on and just just don't get a round trip. You just that's it. You're done. You're at Rutgers. One way ticket. Your deal. Like it would it. be f- extremely funny if like Shiano pulled that off and it was just like, "Yeah, we're hiring their coach," and it's like, "Wait, did he?" Get on the plane with the basketball. I'm, oh, I'm, I can't wait. I'm using that tweet tomorrow because it's going to happen now. <laughs> it's going to be perfect. But uh, no, maybe, probably not going to happen like that. But it's just you never know. We always – big conspiracy theories over on this podcast. So. We'll see. It could happen. But for now, this will go back off. Um, yeah, so basketball team plays tomorrow. Uh, home game, one of the last home games of the year. I think there's uh, – like four or five more at Jersey Mike slash the rack. So if you can make it, definitely go out there. Um, I do want to talk one more hoops related thing before we, Bye. we head off here. Um, we have an event, a live event at the Olive Branch on uh, Tuesday, the seventh um, for a, you know, an event that the front office is putting on alongside night society and, and uh, Rutgers rivals. Mm-hmm. Geo Baker will be there as a co-host. Um, There'll be a ton of different athletes there. The tickets are still available. It's going to be a really good time. Um, there's been several events at the Olive Branch I've been to over the years for stuff like this, from the, the Barstool Bench Mob uh, live podcast and other different events. It's, it's a really good time. If you can make it, it's definitely worth attending. Um, it's also going to have 100% of its proceeds go to the Knight Society's Basketball NIL Fund. So the money's going to be going right to the athletes. So it couldn't be for a better cause, especially with all the NIL stuff uh, that's you know, ha- been happening and uh, a lot of the reasons why recruiting has kind of ticked up is because NIL has also ticked up. So correct, definitely attend if you can. Um, uh, yeah, should be cool. Should be able to have a, uh, it sounds like it might be have a live, live podcast going on. So that should be pretty mm-hmm. cool. We'll see how that works out. I'm sure there'll be a couple technical difficulties at first, but we'll make it work. <laughs> um, it's going to be live streamed on our YouTube, which you are probably listening to or on what else? Twitter, Facebook, Inst- no, I don't know about Instagram. That one's tough. But uh, yeah, stay tuned. It should be something cool to do, and uh, hopefully we can do more of these in the future. And uh, maybe uh, maybe we'll get a couple people on. I know Geo wants to hop on. I know Austin Johnson's going to be there, supposedly. Yep. Um, I don't know who else in terms of uh, big names, but I'm sure they'll be revealing a couple in the, couple, uh, couple in the next coming days. 
Damn, that was a sentence. <laughs> um, and then uh, Saturday, don't forget, big game in MSG. Get the drink early. 7 a.m. The bar's open. I was told. I very tempted to just go. say, "Chris, go cover the game. I'm going over here." <laughs> um, no, I won't be doing that. I will be. Uh, I will be going to the game and covering it. Uh, what else? So just make it a five day bender and go on Tuesday too. Like there you why go. Not? Like yeah. So well, that's all I got. if you're a real fan, you would. That's all. I'm yeah. Doing. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, uh, should we well, we have to mention. Uh, we didn't mention this with football, I guess. The, the bad news. Yes, yeah. So before we get yeah, into to, to recruiting, um, there was some news that broke late last night uh, that Anthony Johnson, the freshman linebacker, has been dismissed with the team from the team for violating team rules. Um, not sure how much of this news is, like has actually broken or actually is known mm-hmm. right now. But what are you what are you hearing about Anthony Johnson? Yeah, it sounds like it was a simple no a theft and simple assault. Um, so it was only a theft and not a robbery because it's under two hundred dollars. So I don't mm-hmm. know what the extent of that was. It was on Livingston campus. Um, it's really all we know. We don't have the police report um, hasn't been given to us yet. I did request it, so we'll see what what the deal is there. Um, but yeah, it's it's he's he's gone. He's off the team. It has to be pretty extensive considering the fact that. He will let Chris Long and Max Melton back after a paintball incident, which was technically yeah. assault as well. Um, I shouldn't say technically. I think that is full-blown assault, right? Uh, yeah, I think by the letter of the law it was. Yeah, yeah and he, they were allowed back on the team. Now, this one's a little bit different because uh, there was theft involved as well. So maybe it was just more of a, that's it. Or maybe he had a chance to apologize, didn't. I don't know. I don't know the extent of the details, but he is gone. Um, and I hate to say a lot of four stars haven't worked out for Rutgers and for various yep. reasons over the past couple of years. Marion Brown didn't make it. Uh, Elijah Clark transferred immediately. Um, yep. Who else? There's, there's a couple others I can't think off the top of my head. But, uh, yeah, it just it hasn't been good for uh, – it is what it is. Just move on and so be it. He wasn't going to contribute this year anyway. So this linebacker course deep, not really a concern in my opinion. Yeah, it's unfortunate because he was a high-profile recruit, and I know he was kind of helping recruit other Philly area guys. And uh, mm-hmm. that's where it didn't really work out a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah it sucks. But you have but. Sam Brown, who's the Philly guy too, and it's just all right. We're just gonna that's true. Put you on a pedestal. Yeah, I'm. I'm excited to see what the uh, the new offensive staff does with uh, Sam and Brown because I'd imagine this isn't really. <laughs> Going out on a limb here, I, th- I think he's going to be the focal point of our offense this year. Um, yeah, hundred percent. But let's talk high school football recruiting. Uh, we were talking about this off the pod. But a lot of uh, updates, um, a lot of recruiting nuggets who we're about to to, to to drop here and bestow upon you. Not all of them great, but uh, what are you hearing? Obviously, a lot of there was the the commitment of the. The top 100 kid out of the class of 25, top kid in New Jersey to Penn State yeah. yesterday, which is which kind of sucks. But I'd almost rather have that happen super early and not have it draw mm-hmm. out where, you know, he's pretending he's interested in Rutgers. If he's not. What are you hearing from a lot of the other top recruits in the class of 24? So he actually was interested in Rutgers. He visited on the 15th or 14th, mm-hmm. whatever that's on. I think it was 15th. That's Sunday. Um, definitely interested in Rutgers. Got that turns on it. 1150, whatever. Uh, anyway, uh, he, um, yeah, he was interested in Rutgers. It's just, there's nothing. He got to Penn State's campus, loves the campus, wanted to stay local. So I'm sure Rutgers is going to still push. And uh, it's just a long way to go until 2025 signing day. Um, we're talking two years at least. Like, yep. So they'll still push for him. Still, he's still going to take visits. Like, I don't care what anyone says. He, there's no way he's not going to. Now, Penn State doesn't agree with that either. So it's the same as Shiano where they don't want your taking visits whatsoever so we'll we'll see what happens that's kind of what happened a couple years ago with uh matthias barnwell who committed june 2020 was a 2023 kid so didn't sign till december 2022 this this past like month or a month ago and he ended up decommitting six months took visits and then recommitted so I, i could see a situation like that happening i could see him decommitting completely but he does like the idea of staying somewhat local in the northeast he likes the northeast area so enough about him um other updates, I'm looking – I'm just going through the offers list today. Uh, quarterbacks, I don't think they're going to get any of the quarterbacks they've offered so far. Four of them have already kind of – or three of them have already kind of eliminated them. Two others have committed elsewhere to Georgia and TCU. 
And AJ Sarace was buddy buddy with uh, Sean Gleason, so I don't end see him end up coming to Rutgers. I think there's going to be a new offers sent out over the next couple months when schools can when Kirk actually can get out and uh, see kids throw. Now, one name I wanted to mention, uh, I forgot what his name was. Damn it, I had him have an article written up on him too. So give me one sec, bear with me. But uh, there's an Illinois quarterback that they want to get on campus sometime soon. Uh, Kirk's actually going to go see him throw, as are a couple other coaches as well. Uh, shit, what was his name? I don't know. I'm going to keep looking for it. But at the same time, uh, he's going to be there's there's going to be a bunch of new offers in terms of uh quarterbacks in the next couple months, and th- I think that's when you're going to actually find one. Uh, Justin Willis was on campus uh Tuesday for the uh what game was that? I don't even remember what what uh hoops game it was. Jeez. Uh, who did they play? Who did they beat? Oh, oh they beat Penn State. Yeah, they beat they Penn, Penn State. State yeah, yeah. Duh. Yeah, so uh, he's going to be one to, one to really watch. He wants to stay close to home. He likes Rutgers a lot. Um, the, all the big North guys were taking pictures together. That was kind of cool to see. Um, Jalen McLean was there. Um, who was the other one? There was another. Uh, Kosh Sanders. Uh, but it sounds like right now he's going to be the most closest, I guess, to committing, if you want to go like that. Uh, trying to like who else? Jalen Hornsby took a visit a couple months ago or a couple weeks ago on a Sunday, right before I shouldn't say a couple weeks, a week ago. The Sunday right before uh, that Penn State game, he came on campus by himself, got to talk with the staff. Now, the good news let's just skip all that bad news shit. <laughs> um, the good news, uh, it does sound like Caden Brown had a hell of a time. Sounds like he's very close to going to Rutgers. I'm very close to future casting him. Um, he went on a couple visits to, he went with the, with Parisi and, um, Aris Bathia and all them. And they went down to Texas for this like whole little tour where it's like rice, LSU, Texas A&M, Texas, and somewhere else. I forget where Houston. Um, so they went on those visits, but it sounded like he didn't really care for those visits at all. Like he was Mm. just kind of going just because it was already booked and you didn't have a choice at this point. So they got to go to a camp and stuff, and he won, I think, best edge rusher. If you saw the clips on our site, it's the it man's just quick as shit. Um, but if Caden Brown commits, it sounds like it's going to be like a trickle down effect, and it sounds like New York to Rutgers is happening once again in the 2024 class. So I'd keep a close eye on our future cast. We're very close to submitting one, possibly two, uh, maybe, okay, maybe a third. The third's pushing it a little bit. I might be reaching a little there, but one's very close to definite. One's Definite. If I submit the first one, the second one's coming. And then the third one, uh, I'm like 50-50 on. Interesting. So, yeah, I mean, it sounds like New York is going to be their uh, their go-to again to start the class at least, and uh, at least a nice little chunk of it. Uh, looking at the rest of the names, it doesn't seem like uh, anyone else is really close. They did get Jordan Thomas on campus again, who's number okay. one in Jersey for 2024. He's just uh, he's someone to monitor because he's very quiet. So maybe he might just not like the whole galore of uh, this big name school, that big name school. But at the end of the day, as we as we know, this kind of happens almost every time now. It's just like someone's going to come in and drop a bag, and it's like, oh my god, wow! I never thought I would like uh, Iowa State. Wow, uh, it's, yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. There's so much money. <laughs> <laughs> um, Iowa State's a bad example, but uh, I should have used Michigan State in that one. But. Uh, yeah, so there's no one else really close, but I would keep a close eye on Caden Brown, Corey Duff, Yusin Willis, and uh, I think that's a bad I, – I, you know, one I would keep an eye on too, Marcus Harrison's intriguing. He's a New York kid. He's massive. He's from uh, – I forget what town it is. It's like – I think it's western New York, if I got that right. Um, St. Francis in Hamburg, New York. I believe That might just okay. be – Upper West New York, I forget where the hell it is exactly, but I know it's not anywhere near um, the New York that I call New York. But uh, yeah, it's near Buffalo, so that would be another one to keep an eye on. But everyone else is kind of kind of quiet. Everyone's kind of doing their own thing. Kids are committing, so it's starting to happen again. But February is a dead period, so we get to take a break. We get to focus on hoops, so that's fun. And then uh, we could start planning our March Madness trips. Hopefully, all the and MSG, so we don't have to go very far. I hope so. Um, um, yeah, I think that's it. All right, so a lot of nuggets there. Uh, a lot of good news, it seems, especially from the state of New York that could be coming Rutgers' way in the near future. Um, we covered a lot today, Richie. Is there anything else you wanted to touch on before we, we hop off here? 
No, not that I could think of. Uh, we, we did kind of post some Dylan Harper news. It does sound like that's trending in the right direction. Uh, mm-hmm. On top of that, a certain other com- well, certain other commit, certain commit, um, and Delquan Warren is uh, trend- looking pretty good recently. So uh, we'll have to see uh, what happens there in terms of the rankings that will come out in the first week of March. So uh, I, it sounds like Dylan's going to make a leap from ten to somewhere within top ten or top nine or top eight, top six, top five. Uh, and Delquan Warren's ninety one right now, and I don't expect him to stay there either. That's going to be like. Top, I don't know what number yet, but um, it's it's he's moving up. It sounds like so. Interesting. This, uh, this this is interesting. So something to watch. By the way, Kale McTenia. I'm gonna post the article on him either today or tomorrow. He's from Illinois. He uh, four six forty yard dash to quarterback. I mean, it's, it's pretty solid. It's hand timed. It's I think That's it's really hand-timed. good for a quarterback. I think it's hand timed. I might be wrong on that. Um. Six three two ten. Like you saw, he might be someone to watch. That's, I'm just saying, he wants to visit campus, and uh, well, we'll see. Interesting. Um, another kid to watch for a potential quarterback commit uh, because you know it sounds like Kirk really knows what he's doing in terms of targeting quarterbacks based mm-hmm. on everything we've heard, we've talked about on here. So I, I think anybody he's targeting is probably worth perking your ears up a little bit. Um, yes, exactly. Also, Pike was down at McEachern High School this past week. The whole staff actually was down there to see, mm-hmm. obviously, uh, Del, or not Del Corner, um, to Michael Davis, the 23 commit, and also Ace Bailey, the t- class of 24 commit. Yep. I imagine they're going to have to make a lot of trips to go out to see him and keep showing the love until signing day 2024 because it doesn't sound like teams are going to ease up at all on Ace Bailey. Um, no. Now, interestingly enough, it does sound like um... – Auburn is not happy at all whatsoever. I can but, imagine. Hey, sucks to suck. But they're about to land. Ironically, they're about to land um, a Jersey kid, it sounds like, in uh, oh, Tahad, yeah? Pet- Tahad Pettiford, who was like number 20. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yep. So it's a little bit of irony there, considering Rutgers went down to Georgia. I know Auburn's not in Georgia before anyone criticizes me. It's right there. <laughs> um, so it's a little irony there that Rutgers went down to Georgia, got a kid to come up here, and now Auburn's going up to Jersey and grabbing a kid out of Rucker's backyard, so it is funny. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. Rucker's is, is now firmly playing with the big boys, and the big boys apparently don't like it. Uh, shocker! Um, wow, no way. Yeah. Uh, but all right, guys. Well, thanks again for listening. Uh, if you haven't already, please like and subscribe on YouTube. Rate us on your favorite podcasting app. It really helps people find the show. Really helps us grow our audience. We've done. You know, a ton of growth this past year, and we want to continue that into 2023. Um, but stay tuned to your podcast feed in case it's something that breaks uh, over the next, you know, few days. And also stay tuned to the boards because there's always interesting information dropping there. We have a special so, guest later this week, don't we? We do. We have a very special podcast later this week with Pat Lawless, who you guys know from the front office. We've had him on a couple times. And also Jim mm-hmm. Baker is going to be joining the show. Yes. Uh, this is scheduled to happen on Friday. Not entirely sure the time yet, but we'll try and get that podcast out on Friday at some point. It's mm-hmm. going to be previewing the live event we talked about with the front office and Night Society. I'm sure we'll get into you know a ton of different stories with Gio um, about his playing career at Rutgers, about what he's doing post-basketball uh, life, and all that good stuff. So stay tuned to your podcast feed on Friday because that'll be a pretty fun episode. Yes, and if you have any questions, um, you know where to submit them on our boards. So we'll try to sneak a couple in here and there for Gio. Yep. But uh, for me and Richie, it's been another edition of the Net Report Podcast signing off. Cool. Could be. Uh...